I do just want to come to this point, if I may, about dark optimism and David's kind of take on that. I mean, it's, it's a difficult one, this, because we probably, almost everybody I know, almost everybody, still subscribes to the idea that there is a way out of total collapse in the current system. Not completely everybody, but most people. Because once you go to that place psychologically, everything changes. You're suddenly in a very different place. David absolutely did not in any way try to ignore or deny the inevitability of collapse. And that made it quite interesting, because sometimes you'd be having a conversation about what needs to happen next. And because I would be thinking about how that would help a transition to a better place, David would be thinking, how will that help us prepare for the post-collapse reality that we're heading towards? And that is quite difficult to, to deal with, because we're not good at handling collapse scenarios, frankly. It's not really in our psyche to try and think things through the lens of inevitable collapse. Um, and he and I used to have endless rows about all of that, because I don't, I didn't then, this is a long time ago, 35 years ago, and I don't now subscribe to a kind of collapse uh, view of the world. But David taught me more about why one doesn't need to subscribe to that view than anybody else from my persuasion, as it were, who somehow continue with uh, lots of illusions hanging around as to what might happen. So I don't know how you'd describe, David, on the continuum of pessimism to optimism. I think you'd have to put him more in a sort of realism-type position around which his own ideas would revolve. I'd like to read um, his fairly brief entry on uh, success. Um, and he writes... Do you really think that we will get through this time and come in due course to a time of resilience, manners, and a harmonic order? Don't answer that question, for you may discover to your cost that the answer is either a self-fulfilling or a self-denying truth, and that both count against us. If we deny that there is a livable future, then we will do little to secure one. If we affirm it, we come into other troubles, such as complacency, an optimistic view that what we are doing now is all that is needed, an iconic focus on the simple solution, or the constant anxiety of life on the edge between hope and doubt. Positive thinking seems to be the right thing in the circumstances until you notice the wreckage. Instead, think of what happened to Orpheus and Eurydice. Eurydice, you may remember, died after having been bitten by a snake, and Orpheus went down into the underworld to recover her. The goddess Persephone agreed to let her go on condition that Orpheus did not look back at her as she followed him. Unfortunately, he forgot about this condition, he did look back, with the result that Eurydice vanished forever, and Orpheus was torn to pieces by angry women who threw his head into the river Hebros, where it floated downstream, still singing. That is, make the intense commitment, at walking pace, plod on, climb steeply uphill out of the underworld, keep your eyes fixed ahead. You never know, you might get there, you might even find out where there is, and you might inspire others to come with you. Just don't look back. We do not need to choose between hope and expectation. What matters is to keep hope alive, which we won't succeed in doing if we are constantly checking up on it. It is not certainty that sustains our focus, but the ambiguity that comes to us, for instance, in the prayer from another ancient moment of commitment against the odds. Quote, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. We could see no way forward for our modern economy. The modern global, neoliberal, market-based economy. Couldn't see how an economy that was permanently fixated with the need for economic growth, not just next year and the year after, but economic growth indefinitely into the future. And let's not turn away from that. There is no conventional political party anywhere in the world that has any interest in trying to think through what we should be doing for humankind that doesn't have economic growth as the underpinning foundation. And that's why he wasn't contemptuous of, but he was always gently wry and dismissive about what I've called in my forward these halfway houses, these places that people get to, to kind of escape this logic of collapse. And you look at all these things, and I'm, I'm sort of involved in a lot of these efforts to mitigate the worst impacts of today's neoliberal market economy, and David would always say, yeah, no, well, we probably do need to do a bit of mitigation work 
along the way, but let's not forget where that's going to take us. And indeed, in some cases, he would feel that the more, the more time and effort that we devoted to ameliorating the worst impacts of that economy, mitigating the worst impacts, the less helpful it was in shaping people's views about what needed to happen next. And that, I think, is the more interesting story, what would happen next, because that was where David really began to develop unique ideas about the resilience of different systems, different economies, different countries, different communities, how we could do that if you could not fall back on the expectation of economic growth as the sort of answer to all our problems. And this is, I think, where some of the most astonishing stuff that David did comes into its own, this understanding that there are ways in which we can build the resilience of communities and of whole countries to increase that sense of culture which lies at the heart of all good living together. He absolutely saw that any community, any society, any culture that didn't have conviviality, living well together at its heart was extremely unlikely to prosper and thrive, even today in a growth economy, let alone tomorrow in a less growth or no growth economy. He says, actually, it doesn't really matter what our predictions about the future are, because the only path forward in either scenario or in any scenario is based on, on community and on culture. He says that um, the only thing that's going to hold together a cohesive society in the absence of the abundance of the growing market is a sense of, of community integration. And he makes a very strong case that this is actually how society thrived for almost all of human history, that this, this growth-based market economy has only really been about around a couple of hundred years. <laughs> Um, and that community and culture and what he calls the informal economy, what a lot of people call the gift economy, um, has been the basis of that throughout history. So it's not that he's invented this brilliant new idea that's going to save us all, but rather that he's saying, you know, we just need to go back to what's always worked. Why uh, David wrote this way is because he had such a holistic way of thinking. Um, you know, he tried to speak about anything and he found it hitched to everything else. And so every talk he would be asked to speak for 20 minutes on such and such and he would try to say the entirety of this. <laughs> because, you know, if you don't understand this, then where, how are you going to understand what I'm talking about? And so he really is starting from very different premises. And that's why I think a lot of people find it very challenging. He's, he's challenging a lot of the fundamental assumptions of our culture, really. My hope really is that this, this paperback, Surviving the Future, is a sort of gateway drug that people sort of read it and, and fall in love with David's way of writing and think, oh, wow, now I want more. And then suddenly the, the, the great work doesn't seem so daunting. Lean Logic finds that when dealing with great matters, it can from time to time be a good thing if there are cracks and faults in the argument, for the repair of which help is invited. It is a reminder that a conversation is a cooperative affair, not just a series of beautifully manicured statements. So on that note, I invite you to David's conversation um, on sale at the back of the room. And um, thank you all for coming to be part of this conversation.